it's all unraveling because it's hypocrisy and lie built upon lie built upon lie like a tower of lies and this is what gets me these are Israeli soldier videos it's like mm. you know most people who commit ethnic cleansing or genocide you know they're at least ashamed about it they don't advertise it <laughs> Israel claimed to have found proof that UNRWA staff took part in Hamas's attacks. We haven't had the ability to investigate them ourselves, but they are highly, highly credible. It's both uninvestigated and highly credible. <laughs> Not highly credible, it's highly, highly credible. They are highly, highly credible. The nations which have oil money, the Muslim nations, why haven't they stepped up to the plate to fund UNRWA? These are more their people than they are the West's people. Why aren't they concerned? Why don't they spend some of their money on UNRWA? This all represents extreme hypocrisy. I mean, it exposes the truth of the Quranic statement that corruption has spread over land and sea. Zionism has exposed the hypocrisy of both the East and the West. There is no saviour in sight. Or is there? That's what we're going to be talking about in the context, Brother Tahir, of this landmark ICJ ruling, which is saying that there is a, a plausible case of genocide against Israel. Mm. Why don't you remind us of why this case exists? Well, I mean, I think it's... Um, a lot of people have seen the, the, the awful footage that has been coming out of Gaza. But I think some of the most striking footage is actually the footage that's coming out from the phones of Israeli soldiers. Mm. So this is something that's kind of been developing in the last two weeks or so. Mm -hmm. And this is one such example of them demolishing people's homes. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's worth taking a look at. So here you can see a, a complete and utter demolition of uh, one of the neighborhoods of Gaza, mm. you know, and you can hear Israeli soldiers cheering as well. Um, and this is a compilation of multiple places that have been bombed and, you know, 60% of the buildings of, of Gaza, over 60% have been destroyed. And The Guardian did a really good analysis of this. Really? On their, yeah, yeah, really good analysis. And this is what gets me. These are Israeli soldier videos. It's like, mm. you know, most people who commit ethnic cleansing or genocide, you know, they're at least ashamed about it. They don't advertise it. Mm. These people have such little insight into their gen genocidal rhetoric behavior. Well, it's been called the first live stream genocide, hasn't it? But it's being live streamed by the soldiers. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's like they have zero insight and, and I think into what this is. That speaks to the... Um to the propaganda that, that, that exists within Israeli society. That's correct. That militarizes young people against Arabs and yes, against Palestinians. That's, it, that's exactly right. And, and they see them as a subhuman and for some, and they can't conceive that other people might be disgusted by this kind of behavior. Yeah. yeah. So they literally produce TikTok and, and I, videos And I think about also it. that's also partly why the, many of the propaganda attempts by Israel are so absurd. Yeah, They're I know. so ridiculous <laughs> when you watch them. <laughs> yeah, they are. And it must be, the only explanation is that they... They think that they're so much smarter than everyone else. They think that everyone else is such an idiot that yeah. they won't see through this. Yeah. So yeah. this kind of superiority complex actually ends up it's making their own work incredibly inferior. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think that's a very good point. You know, this is, uh, it's damning and the ICG, ICJ ruling, even though it's not a final verdict, you know, the fact that it found in, in the face of the whole Western apparatus, such strong grounds for a genocide case and indeed asked Israel or, or told Israel mm. to stop these various actions, which are looking potentially like genocide and to report back to it. Mm. It is in itself damning. Yeah, right? it is in itself damning. And that is, it should be a wake up call to the West, which has been, you know, funding Israel to the hilt for decades and has been supporting, you know, Israel completely. Uh, but what was their, what was their response to, to this? To this well, it was ruling? completely muted. And what was uh, really interesting was the very next day, Israel made allegations against the UN. So it's basically like the UN body, the court, yeah. put Israel in the dock on one day. And yeah. the very next day, the uh, Israeli government made allegations against the United Nations Refugees Workers Agency, which What's is known that? as UNRWA, which is okay. the, the body that was set up to deal with the rights and the education and the social services hmm. of uh, Palestinian refugees. And you're saying Israel attacked them? Israel attacked them. They're a UN body. Hmm. So it's basically it was a tit for tat. So the UN... Put, put Israel in the dock. I said, you're on case of plausible genocide. And the very next day, Israel put a UN body in the dock, which mm. dealt with refugees. Well, on, there's no dock. There's no judgment. That's absolutely right. Yeah, it's just, they just, did their best. just accusations. Really. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, they employ 30,000 Palestinians mm. um, in Gaza and they have... They, they made an allegation against 12, which has then been increased to 13 individuals. Um, as, as being part of Hamas? As having, being, Hamas as having participated in October, on October 7th. Okay. Um, and then there's some reports in Sky News that that was cut down to seven. But the point I want to emphasize is that you know, the, the response from the West was completely muted on the ICJ ruling. Yeah. But then the very next day, they covered the UNRWA thing enormously and defunded UNRWA. Yeah. So UNRWA is basically, you can think of it, I was listening to the, to the, the former spokesperson 
of UNRWA, um, who stepped down, I think, in 2020, perhaps. And he said that basically UNRWA, you can think of it as a government, hmm. okay? It provides hundreds of millions of pounds worth of services right. to uh, millions of people in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and uh, Gaza, West Bank, etc. Hmm. It provides services such as vaccination programs, primary health clinics, education. They run hundreds of schools. They run, you know, they do hundreds of funding opportunities for people, for small businesses, small loans, these kinds of things. Right. They effectively produce a social services system for the Palestinian people. Yeah. So the, the Western response was in response to being accused of being complicit essentially in genocide yeah. is to Funding further it. punish the Palestinian people. Yeah, and it's extraordinary because the ICJ ruling was saying on the, you know, the second, one of the aspects of it was that you t- must permit humanitarian aid to get in. Hmm. Now, the overwhelming majority of humanitarian aid is via UNRWA. But I can't imagine the Americans would do such thing without uh, strong evidence. Has Secretary Blinken spoken about the the, the strong evidence which has come to them? <laughs> you know, they were some of the pioneers in evidence-based culture. Yeah, of course. The, the, the most important people on earth in evidence-based <laughs> culture, one could even say. So this is this is Secretary Blinken talking about, this is broken by Forbes again. So this yeah. is four days ago. And this is what Anthony Blinken, the United States Secretary of State, had to say about the United States' decision to defund UNRWA. And, and they supply about £350 million pounds mm-hmm. a year uh, and they audit it extremely extremely stringently nothing on the aid they give to israel nothing on the end i mean yeah exactly so you know they give at least i think four billion a year to israel yeah, historically i think it's probably more now it's but probably yeah. more yeah so let's have a look at what he has to say we're going to be looking very hard at the steps that UNRWA takes again to make sure that uh, this is fully and thoroughly investigated we haven't had the ability to investigate them ourselves but they are highly highly credible so that's particularly what I want to highlight, too, which is that, you know, how can you say you're going to investigate something uh, and it's highly, highly credible, um, but you're yet to investigate it? So you haven't invested, you've acted on it. You, you've acted on it. And you haven't if, investigated it, haven't but it's been, also highly credible. Not highly credible. It's highly, highly credible. But they are highly, highly credible. He had to add in the highly, <laughs> the second highly. Schrodinger's dossier. <laughs> <laughs> it's both uninvestigated and highly credible. <laughs> I mean, and thus we must not look at it because we don't know which one is going to end up as. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a very good way of putting it. I mean, it's, a, it's just a totally, you know, brain dead way of talking. But, but, it, but it's not brain dead. It's, it's motivated. Yeah, this is often the thing. You know, you think people are behaving in ways which are stupid, but they're not. It makes perfect logical sense hmm. when you consider that he's not interested in whether it's true or not. Yeah. He's only interested in using it as an excuse to distort the media ruling on the ICJ, pull yeah. the attention away from that, put the attention onto the Palestinians yeah. and and give a, a a legitimate a semi you know some appar- some appearance of legitimacy mm. to um get rid of one of Israel's main uh to, uh, to, you know issues which is with UNRWA he, they want it dismantled. And I think this is one of the main things that's come out of this entire so-called conflict yeah. which is that the hypocrisy of the west is just so glaring. Yeah. I mean for so many years they've been demonizing Russia for their invasion of Ukraine and there's a whole it's a whole you know geopolitical issue in its own self yeah. which we're not going to cover here. However when there is um, a conflict of Israel and occupying power taking further action against the Palestinians and murdering Far more civilians than even Russia has done. Yeah, they're completely all for I mean, it. I think in two. I think in since the war uh, it, of in Russia in Ukraine, Russia has you know approximately five hundred children have been killed. Okay, you know, which is awful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's over a two year span. Yeah. And a war that has taken the lives of probably half a million, hundred, probably about half a million yeah. soldiers in total. About four hundred thousand of them being Ukrainian. Mm. Okay, so it's been a proper soldier to soldier warfare, mm. and about five hundred children have been killed. Five hundred to a thousand now, probably. Right. Yeah, and I think they say ten thousand. I think at a push, twenty thousand, probably about. 10,000-ish um, civilians in yeah, Ukraine. Yeah, so, so the civilian... Which is, which is still a very large number. It's a large number, but for the, when you look at the civilian to casualty, to civilian to soldier death ratio, there, yeah. you know, you're looking at orders of magnitude 50, here. Yeah. It's one to 50, yeah. all right? When you look at the, the civilian casualty ratio of soldiers to civilians in, in Israel, it's the opposite way around. It's two to one yeah. of civilian to mm. apparent soldier. We don't even have those verified details from Israel anyway, because mm. they haven't got a clue. They drop a bomb on a neighborhood. How do they know how many people who have- who I'd are, imagine it's a lot more than two to one. Uh, what, civilians to- Yeah. Possibly. It's possible. It's very possible because they've they, they basically been bombing indiscriminately. Yeah. The hypocrisy is absolutely glaring. So 
So this is Bronwyn Maddock. She's the director of Chatham House. And Chatham House is a famous uh, English or British think tank. I think it's the, the Royal Institution of International Affairs. Uh, you know, it's it's one of the old, it's part of the old, the old, old establishment of the UK. And yeah. she's the director. And this was, this was a talk that she gave a few days before um, the ICJ ruling. Maybe to cover themselves, I don't know. Yeah, this is what it's about. But um, let's take a look at what she said, because she has some truth, but she also reveals the Western hand as well. The charge of hypocrisy is an old one. It runs like this. The West cares about democracy, but not when it wants to install leaders it likes in other countries. It respects sovereignty, except when it doesn't, say in Iraq. It argues for self-determination in Taiwan, but not Catalonia. It supports human rights, but not in countries from which it needs oil. It defends human rights until it gets too difficult, as in Afghanistan. And these accusations, if unanswered, give those who want to undermine the West a weapon, even when their own hypocrisy is luminous. Some inconsistency is undeniable. Western governments, though, do have some defense, I think, that their foreign policy must be shaped also by calculations of national self-interest. As democracies, they cannot depart far from this. But they should be able to show that the record is broadly compatible with underlying principles if they are to urge those principles on others. And they have not always been able to do that. And this charge of double standards has been brought to a new heat by Gaza. Israel's pursuit of Hamas in response to the attack of October 7th, when Hamas killed 1,200 Israelis and took around 240 hostage, has cost more than 25,000 Palestinian lives, according to the Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry. You rate Israeli lives as more important than Palestinian lives, is the accusation. You talk about laws of war, but Israel has broken them, is another. But myself, I think the charge of double standards over Gaza is well-founded in two respects. The first is that Western countries, above all the US, allow the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to fester and Israel to abuse its power in expanding its settlements into the West Bank onto land earmarked for any future Palestinian state. They allowed Israeli governments to push Palestinian claims off the agenda, reckoning that the issue would just go away. Some Arab governments were complicit in this. One senior Gulf official suggested to me with a shrug just a couple of weeks before October 7th that Israel would no doubt have taken the West Bank with its settlements within 15 years. Okay, so in that, she's basically saying that uh, there's a charge of hypocrisy against the West and the old order, and it's undermining them, and actually that it's true, and that Israel is showing that the charge of the Global South against the West is true, that you guys claim to follow one set of rules, but actually it only suits you when it's kind of the blue-eyed people and anyone else, they don't really care. Mm. Did you get that from that, and, and what else did you take away from it? I thought that was, you know, obviously she definitely said that, but there was also something much more revealing, which is that she indicated that the main concern she had was that this charge of uh, hypocrisy was being weaponized by uh, the West's enemies, by Russia, China, uh, and it would be used to undermine the domination of the West mm. uh, on the international scene. And so it seems to be the case that they're only concerned about hypocrisy mm. when it's against their self-interest, right. which is actually the very nub of the problem. It's mm. the very root of the issue which leads to hypocrisy in the first place, which yeah. is that you say one thing and do another yeah. because you want people to listen to your but your portrayal of yourself, but in reality, you only behave in accordance with your own self-interest. Mm. This has been quite a substantive charge against the West for a very long time. I mean, you look at Iraq and Libya and their actions in Syria and, and actually across the globe for many, many decades, mm. it's actually lawlessness. Yeah. But they're always preaching um, values and principles to the third world and to their enemies in the first and second world, mm. which they never adhere to. And you can't, I mean, as John Stewart famously said, you know, it, their, their values, if you follow them no matter what, if you you just follow them when they suit you, they're hobbies, <laughs> right? Which is, which is actually a very pithy way of putting it, you know, which shows that they're not values because yeah. a value is a principle that you hold no matter what. Yes. And it's not swayed by your self-interest. The whole point of a principle is that you follow it, even if it's against your self-interest. Yes, exactly. So she says in this speech, and she actually justifies Western behavior to some extent by yeah. saying, well, you have to understand nations act in their own self-interest. Well, okay, do that, but then don't claim to be these angels yeah, exactly. who are, who are bringing international law down for, sorry, bringing the rules-based order down from the platonic realm and, to, to earth. And that was a bit of doublespeak on her behalf. So she talked about there being a rules-based order and said, oh, Sergei Lavrov said that there was never, this was never written down. Yeah. 
uh, and and then she says, well, it was. And then she starts citing legal code, the UN yeah. Charter, etc. But that's not what the rules-based order is, and she probably knows yeah, it. Yeah, because the West, you because know, the, the West goes against the, uh, those articles all the time. It, no, no, not only that. So it used to be called the law-based order, hmm. right? That's what the world, that's what the terms that used to be used, that you're going against international law, that yeah. there was a law-based order. And then in recent years, especially after Iraq, they started saying the rules-based order, Yeah. okay? And the reason they started saying the rules-based order is because they didn't want to be called caught out yeah. on the fact that they had themselves violated the law, international law with Iraq. Yeah. Right? Uh, because it was deemed, it was an illegal war. Yeah. Right? Um, so the... So, so rules-based basically became like a gentleman's yes. rules in a, in a kind of country club yes. or in a men's club like, Where you know, no, no, like Chatham House. Like Chatham, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's, that's why Sergei Lavrov said the rules are never written down. Yeah. Because they're not laws. Because if you're saying you follow these rules and you follow the rules-based order, well, that's definitely not international law. Yeah, well, right? exa exactly. So then she pretends, perhaps knowingly, perhaps unknowingly, I'm nodding her head, that the rules-based order is the same as the law-based order. But that's doublespeak because everybody knows it's not. There's the reason why the UK, the US moved away from saying law-based order mm. and international law and moved into saying rules-based order. And I think this is demonstrated also by um, their concern for particular nations and particular situations, but not others. So for instance, they're mightily concerned for the plight of Ukrainians and Ukrainian civil civilians in the um, Russia, in the war, in the after the invasion by Russia, which was then further perpetuated uh, one can say by Western inter diplomatic interventions. Yeah. So they're very, very concerned about Ukrainians there, mm. but they're not as concerned at all about Gazans. Yeah. In fact, when the uh, case was brought, you know, to the ICJ, yeah, we can get it up actually. When the case was brought to the ICJ about by Ukraine accusing Russia of so many uh, violations of international law. Let's see what happened. Yeah, so this was this was this month as well. Mm. So this was the two cases were heard at the ICA, Palestine and Ukraine. Yeah. Simultaneously almost, the yeah. judgments were given, terms of judgment, an interim ruling with the Palestinians. Tell us a bit more about the court's decision today. Is it a victory for Russia, a victory for Ukraine, indeed a victory for both? Well, this is clearly a victory for Russia, uh, Nadia, because almost all of Ukraine's allegations here were thrown out. Now, they had brought this case under two different treaties. One is that Financing of Terrorism Act, and they were hoping to pin Russia's support for militias in eastern Ukraine uh, under this act. However, this court ruled that the provision of weapons, the provision of training, that did not violate this act. It is only about providing money. Uh, now, that also destroyed any hopes from Ukraine to pin, for example, the um, downing of flight MH17, which it has been proven by another court here in The Hague that the weapons were produced by Russia. Uh, that basically disappeared with that ruling. Uh, the only thing that this court found is under that financing of Terrorism Act that Russia failed to comply because they failed to investigate certain individuals who were um, told, uh, who Ukraine told them could be financing terrorism. So that was a violation, but that's small beef if you look at the bigger picture. So, I mean, the even the headline there says, or oh, ICJ says Russia violates parts of UN anti-terrorism treaty. I mean, that's true, but actually the headline should be that the ICG, ICJ threw out most of the case. Yeah, exactly. Right? And, and, and that's uh, amazing that these two things happened almost simultaneously. And, you know, I think that's the only place I've seen it being covered mm. is, is France 24. I'm sure if you look, but it won't be headlined anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Right? Just um, the ICJ ruling just wasn't. Just the ICJ <laughs> wasn't. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, this kind of, this kind of juxtaposition in time between, mm. for example, the ICJ ruling on Russia, the ICJ ruling on Palestine, and then the UNRWA defunding. Yeah. This all represents a kind of extreme hypocrisy mm. of, of, of trying to pull the wool over the world's eyes. Mm. But it's, it's a bit insulting. I mean, we're not stupid. We know how to use Google. Yeah. Like everybody can see it for what it is. It's open. Mm. It's completely open for everybody to see. Mm. Okay. So what we've seen so far quite clearly is that there is huge hypocrisy in the way that the that the West conducts itself. Yeah, I mean- uh, As it, demonstrated by this Israel issue, you're gone. If I can just show this. So this is uh, another really important point related to the media coverage, right. which is that, you know, the BBC, when uh, Israel uh, was in the dock for one day, and, uh, the South African- the South African prosecutors were making their case before the ICJ. One day, the very next day, Israel was making their case of yeah. defense yeah. at the ICJ. You know, South Africa, um, the South African case that day wasn't shown on the BBC. Hmm. They didn't live stream it. They didn't cover it. There was nothing. Hmm. The very next day when Israel presents its defense, it was live streamed. Right. 
right? A complete and open, uh, naked um, example of hypocrisy yeah. and bias. Yeah. Uh, and this was one particular individual um, who got quite a lot of views on this tweet, 2.6 million. I've never done a formal complaint against the BBC, but the decision not to broadcast the prosecution case in the genocide trial of Israel and then to broadcast the entire Israeli defense is so blatantly corrupt that I think it'd be good to watch them squirm. Shall we do it? Hmm. So this is an example of this kind of uh, hypocrisy on steroids, even at the at the level of media. Yeah. Absolutely. And this hypocrisy actually covers the entire world. We're going to cover towards the end of the video how Zionism has shown the hypocrisy of the Muslim nations as well. Yeah, and their total absolutely. lack of efficacy, their total lack of righteousness and yep. how they don't adhere to the Holy Quran. But first we need to talk about um, how the Zionist actions of today are covered in exquisite detail yeah. in an incredible Quranic prophecy yeah. in chapter two of the Holy Quran. So why don't you start to take us through that? So this again is links deeply to this concept of hypocrisy. Um, and, and, and the reason is the Quran lays it out very clearly chapter two, verse 85. But what does chapter two take us through in general? So chapter two, so it's like, you know, the first chapter of the Quran is a kind of, it's a prayer. It's only seven verses long. Hmm. So, uh, and it's called Surah Al-Fatiha. And then chapter two is kind of the first major uh, legislative chapter of the Quran. It's the the legislative chapter of the Quran. Hmm. And it's the longest chapter of the Quran as well. Uh, And so it opens with the words, this is that perfect book. There is no doubt in it. It is a guidance for the righteous. Hmm. Uh, And it goes through an introductory portion where it defines three categories of people, believers, disbelievers, and hypocrites. Hmm. And then it goes on to give... Uh, the narrative uh, summary of humanity, which is the story of Adam, which is very different in the Quran to the Bible. And then it quickly goes into talking about the Jews. Yeah. And you might wonder, well, why? And the reason is, is because they're a case study for the Muslims. Hmm. What was to happen to them, to the, to the Muslims what ha- yeah. was what had already happened to the Jews. Hmm. And so it goes in particular through one, it goes through some of their crimes in God's eyes as to why God took profited away from them and was then giving profited to the children of Ishmael, their brothers, their cousins. Yeah. For their they were the descendants of Isaac and the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was the descendant of Ishmael. So this is one of the crimes that it, it actually foretells. Hmm. Okay. Because it, it talks about it in the past, but it's a perfect a description of what's happened in Israel. And I would say this is the most pithy, concise description of the actions of Israel over the last 75 years that you will read anywhere. I mean, and we should, we should bear in mind that the Quran often refers to things as occurring in the past when it's clearly talking about future events. Yeah. That's normal actually. Yeah. That's, that's the, that's the way that the Quran operates. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, the Quran does, uses the past tense for events on the day of judgment, for example. Yeah. Because to God, they are settled and they are final and they have, in, in a way, they've already happened in God's eyes. Well, Although, well, the use of the past tense for a future event means it will definitely happen hmm, hmm. because it's as if it has happened. Yeah. Right. So if, do you want me to go through it? Yeah, please. So this is chapter two, verse 85. It might be 86 in Qurans where the Bismillah is not counted as the might first verse. 84, sorry. It says, and remember when we took a covenant from you. And remember when we took a covenant from you. This is addressing the children of Israel. Right. You shall not shed each other's blood, nor turn out your people from their homes, nor turn your people out of your homes. Then you confirmed it and you have been witness to it. Yet you are they who slay one another and turn out a section of your people from their homes, backing up their enemies against them in sin and transgression. And if they come to you as captives, you ransom them while their expulsion itself was unlawful for you. Do you then believe in a part of the book and disbelieve in another part? What is then the reward of such among you as do so, except disgrace in the present life and on the day of judgment, they shall be driven to a most severe chastisement. And surely Allah, God, is not unmindful of what you do. This is such a powerful verse. Do you want to take us through it in particular? Why? Well, um, I think we should continue the, to the next verse, if that's okay first. Okay, sure. And then we'll, then, we'll, then we'll wrap up. It says, These are they who have preferred the present life to the hereafter. Their punishment shall not therefore be lightened, nor shall they be, they be helped in any other way. So, I mean, you know, that last verse is, is so uh, illuminating because it says that the root cause is worldliness. It's not caring for divine law and the hereafter. It's actually caring for the goods that you see in front of you. Yeah. And this has led you to the transgression of the divine law that the Jews had received. So let's go back and let's talk about some of the <clears throat> categories of sin and the categories of transgression that the Quran is saying here. It says, you are the people who slay your own brethren and turn out a section of people from their homes of your people 
of your people, sorry, from their homes. So slay your own brethren and turn out a section of your people from their homes. What do you get from that? So that's clearly it's genocide mm-hmm. to to kill others, mm-hmm. right? With with you know, and the second thing is to turn out a section of the people from their your people from their so homes. Wanton murder. It's wanton murder. Expulsion of and people from their cleansing. Lands. Yeah, it's, it's immediately the first two things are genocide, genocide and ethnic cleansing. Right, and then the third thing is backing up their enemies against them in sin and transgression, which means to divide communities. Hmm. And if they come to you as captives, you ransom them. So again, this is... Unlo- well, I mean, let's, you know, even in the modern day, you can see kind of Hamas versus the uh, the Palestinian Authority, right? Yes, exactly. And and also, you know, the way Israel has um, penetrated other Western societies through covert and overt means, yeah. uh, through lobbying and other, other such things, where they can actually influence all these people and get them to fight against you know, essentially the, the, the Palestinian people. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the, the best example of backing up the enemies against them in sin and transgression is is the example where when Hamas took power in 2006, I think it was, um, you know, Fatah in, in Gaza requested Israel their support. Hmm. And there was a WikiLeaks cable which showed that Netanyahu said, no, we want Gaza to be ruled by Hamas. Hmm. And the reason they want it is because they want the excuse to demolish. They want the excuse uh, to get to, to, they want the opportunity. They want resistance so that they can re- uh, react. Exactly. Disproportionality is not a bug; it's a feature. Mm. That's the point of it. Mm. Um, so then it says unlawful. Then the, so it's talked about genocide. It's talked about ethnic cleansing. It's talked about d- dividing, divide and conquer. Mm. It then talks about uh, unlawful detention. Yeah. <clears throat> so can you take us through this? I mean, this is remarkable. And if they come to you as captives. You ransom them. So if they come to you as captives, it means that you are essentially in some kind of conflict and you mm. capture them and then you ransom them back to their original people yeah. while their expulsion itself was unlawful for you. So it's actually saying that you have already expelled the people, then they react mm. and then you capture them and then you sell them back for, for whatever you want, right? So it's an incredible uh, description of what's been happening in the, in so, over so many decades. Yeah. The Israelis have been expelling the Palestinians from their own hands. It's caused a resistance movement to rise up, yeah. which has caused conflict. Actually, even then, many Palestinians are actually just kidnapped from their homes. Yep. It's not simply in the course of war. Actually, it'd be a mistake to say that. Mm. They've taken them and then they ransom them back. And that's why you see, you know, part of Hamas, we're not saying that we endorse, you know, all the actions of Hamas, but part of what they were doing was trying to get captives so that they could ransom them back for Palestinians. Yeah, that was the main purpose for which they were taking those hostages yeah. is to get, you know, the thousands of uh, Palestinian detainees, detainees for years, children, hundreds of children, um, detained, yeah. um, often without trial. Lots of examples of torture and abuse allegations, yeah. sexual torture, um, physical, uh, mental uh, dehumanization as well. So this is extraordinary because actually what the Quran here is, seems to be saying is that you had no right. After you expelled them, you had no right to mm. take them as captives in some form of lawful warfare mm. because you don't have a right. You know, this is what people often say in the... Um, you know, there was a question of Israel's self right to self-defense. You know, when it began after October 7th, I was like, wow, you know, they really hammered this point. Israel has the right to self-defense. Israel has yeah. the right to self-defense. And undoubtedly, you know, Israel has the right of self-defense. Hmm. But this in is- In the abstract. In the abstract. But you don't have, but what they're doing is not defense. What they're doing is retaliation. Hmm. And so, you know, even some people, even for example, Hossam Zomlot, he was on the on Channel 4 or on BBC, I think, and he said they don't have the right to self-defense because they're the occupying power. Hmm. I think what he meant to say was you don't have the right of retaliation hmm. because you're the occupying power. Hmm. You know, if somebody attacks you on the day that the attack occurs, you can defend yourself. Yeah. But what they've done after that day, the only right they had after that day was they didn't have any right. They, Israel had a duty to end the occupation. Well, if you're talking about rights, they have to they exist within a framework of legitimacy. And of duties. Yeah, rights, and of duties. And, rights and responsibilities go together. Exactly. So if you're already violating yeah. um, your uh, their rights of sovereignty yeah. through occupying a people, to yeah. then talk about further rights that you own I know. in I response know. to their actions yeah. is absurd. Yeah. You know, you, you have to... You have rights within those frameworks. Yeah. So, I mean, let's then talk about what happens next in the verse. It says, do you then believe in a part of the book and then disbelieve in another part, which is just a resounding, um, 
which is actually in many ways incredible because it's talking about how the Israelis and the Zionists will cite some biblical things. Yeah, Amalek. As, yeah, uh, yeah, they'll cite Amalek and they'll cite, you know, their manifest destiny over this yeah. over this land because they are the Jews and this is what the uh this is what the Bible says. Yeah. So they believe in parts of it, but they disbelieve in all the things that regulates their behaviors. <laughs> right? Yeah. And and that's a that's a perfect description of hypocrisy. Yeah. And that's why I think, you know, we wanted to bring this into this discussion on hypocrisy mm. because it's it's glaring that, mm. that he, actually it's hypocrisy, which is at the root cause of all of these problems, mm. is the hypocrisy of the Israelis of the of the Israeli nation, mm. right? Not all Israelis individually, mm. but of the Israeli nation and the government. And then it's also the hypocr- hypocrisy of the the Western governments that are supporting it, mm. which they've roped into this, yeah, right, and which is now actually undermining the West's position vis a vis their own enemies, yeah, vis a vis Russia, vis a vis China, yeah, right. So it's it's all unraveling because it's hypocrisy and lie built upon lie built upon lie like a tower of lies. Yeah. Right? Which is the description of the the jar is what you're referring to which is, there. Which is the what Antichrist. Which is what the Antichrist is. The jaliat means the, uh, uh, layers of lies upon of deception. lies. A culture of deception. So, I mean, what is the result of this? One, you walk us through the next part. Of, I mean, it's just so succinct, this verse. <laughs> so, this is what gets me. In like four lines, like people write books on this stuff. Yeah. And in four lines, God's put his finger on the exact issue yeah. that's at play here, yeah. right? And then he gives you the end result. Yeah. What is then the reward of such among you as do so, except disgrace in the present life? Mm. That's the first thing. Let's just go through that. What do you What do you make of that? Well, what is then the reward of such among you as do so indicates that it's not the entire group. And that's right? really interesting. So it's not, you know, God never actually condemns entire nations, entire yeah. nations, entire peoples. Yeah. He distinguishes between those who act righteously and those who don't and condemns those who act indecently and rewards those who act righteously. And if you, if you look at the biggest outspoken critics of injustices perpetrated by the Israeli state, the mm. best are Israelis. Yeah. You look at Ilan Pape, the best historian on this topic, wrote The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. You look at Norman Finkelstein, he's Jewish by heritage. Mm. You look at Gideon Levy, the editor of Haaretz and one of the columnists for Haaretz. Is a fantastic speaker. You look at Miko Beled, mm. the son of an Israeli general. Yeah. Okay. These are the top speakers out uh, on behalf of Palestinian rights, mm. right? But it's something incredible, actually. It's something I find, uh, you know, we find everywhere, which is that p- poles always exist. There's polarization, everything. When you have the very best, you also create the very worst. Yeah. Humanity has the capacity more than any other animals to do the greatest good and it thereby has the greatest evil. Yeah. And in this case, we see absolutely that there is such great evil happening, uh, you know, amongst these people, but there's also incredible good yeah. and incredible step to fastness and an incredible commitment to truth among many of them. So yeah. that's always important to bear in mind. Yeah. But the Quran doesn't let those who act unrighteously go unrequited except disgrace in the present life. Now, to you, I mean, how is that manifesting? Well, I mean, we've already had the ICJ ruling, the interim ruling, and this doesn't mean to say that they will definitely be, you know, uh, found guilty for genocide by the ICJ. I think there's a lot of other factors, but I think even if there wasn't the ICJ ruling, the interim Mm. ruling, which found them 15 to 2, plausibly committing genocide, Mm. um, even if there wasn't that, they've been disgraced. They've disgraced themselves. Mm. The entire world finds the behavior of the Israeli nation, the government, I should say, uh, to be disgraceful. Yeah. Okay. So they have been disgraced in the eyes of the people of the world by yeah. their behavior. Uh, and then the next the next part of the verse is, and on the day of judgment, they should be driven to a most severe chastisement. And surely Allah is not unmindful of what you do. And this is something which from a religious perspective always gets me is that when we do good things, God talks about the, the benefits even in this life that we will encounter. Mm. And he says that the benefits in the next life in the unseen will be so much greater. Mm. But that also goes for the, for the bad side of things. Mm. If you do things, you know, if you act unrighteously, you will have some effect of those manifesting in this life, but the next life will be the when the veil is lifted. Mm. And that is uh, something which, if you truly believe, is chilling. And it shows the effect of accountability, mm. right? It shows the effect that actually, if you don't believe that you're accountable, then you will do whatever you want. But actually, if you do, then you will hold yourself back. And this is what the Holy Quran is reminding, what God is reminding people of. Surely Allah is not unmindful of what you do. But as we see in the next verse, and it goes on, Right from this, Allah is not unmindful of what you do and explains why they're unmindful because they these are they who have preferred the present life to the hereafter. They have shut their spiritual eye because the goods of the world look so luminous to them mm. that they only focus on them. So it's an incredible verse mm. that just, or a set of verses, it's a passage which which explains the whole situation. I mean, that that's the whole situation. Yeah, it's, it's in a nutshell. It's the beginning, it's, it's the, the reason, the origin, the inception and its end. Yeah, <laughs> it's absolutely stunning. Mm. And this is, you know, if you don't believe in the Quran, I mean, this should actually open your eyes. Hmm. 
as to the depth and profundity of the Holy Quran. How I mean, this, this is three verses. How this is three verses <laughs> of an entire book. How could this have come from uh, uh, an Arab in the seventh century shepherd? How? You know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, one a critic could say, well, to some degree, it applies to the Jewish tribes in in Medina at the time, and that's true. To some degree, it applied, but I mean, the force with which it is no, fulfilled in yeah. the present day is is just unreal. Yeah, it's it's to a far greater extent. Yeah, absolutely. Now we see what the the Muslims have in their hand, but it's remarkable. I was thinking, you know, I think we've all been thinking about where are the Muslims. And I caught this amazing tweet from uh, Alexander Dugan, a Russian philosopher that we've already spoken about at length on our channel. Yeah. Uh, let's just have a look at what, what he said and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So he says, will Palestine be free? That depends on global Islam. If you, our Muslim brethren, have still the dignity and power, the faith and real deep trust in God, the Holy Land will be liberated and we will support you. But that is your war. We Russians have our own war. Okay, so do Muslims, my question to you then is, do Muslims have the dignity and power, the faith and real deep trust in God today? Well, the answer is, is you can't uh, maintain all of these qualities, dignity, power, um, for example, dignity and power in particular, these are attributes of Allah. Mm. Nobody can possess them in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. The moment a person departs from the way that God has demonstrated and given to you to, to obtain the manifestation of his attributes or a reflection of his attributes of dignity mm. and power, which is the Holy Quran, yeah. uh, that is the point at which you, that dignity and power leaves you. And, uh, and similarly, you know, the faith and real deep trust in God is so telling that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that in the latter days, faith will ascend from the earth mm. and go up to the Pleiades, mm. right? The brightest constellation, at And the meaning of that is that faith will no longer be found upon the earth in that age. Right. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that in that time, a person of Persian descent would be appointed from amongst the Muslims to bring back faith from the Pleiades back down to earth. So this is an amazing point that he makes about faith and real deep trust in God yeah. being absent amongst the Muslims. He's asking it. He's kind of saying it as a rhetorical device. He's saying you don't yeah. have it anymore. That's why this is the problem. Mm. Okay. And he's put his finger on the money. You know, yeah. he's put it hundred percent on the right point. I mean, and, and you know, that's what you just said. The prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him says, this is 14 centuries ago. Yeah. He said that this would be the conditions of the Muslims. That it'd be a very poor condition as faith has left them. He said that their mos mosques will be full, but their hearts will be empty. That their, their religious leaders will actually be the worst of people and that strife and turmoil and chaos will go from them and it will return to them. And we've seen that in the modern day, haven't we? We've seen that with modern terrorism about how these people have created so much disorder in the world and have also been obliterated, you know, as all the different pockets come up and they go down. Yeah, this is a really clear hadith. The oh, Prophet you have it, Muhammad. Perfect. No, it's a yeah. different one, but I okay. really I really like this one. This is um, Thoban reporters. This is Sun Abi Dawood. Um, which so is, a hadith, this is a reported utterance of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be yeah, upon him. So yeah. it's something which he said, which was then recorded and, and yeah. narrated. Yeah, he said, the Messenger of Allah said, soon the nations will be summoned to you just like one is invited to a feast. It is said, will we be few in that day? Okay, wait, soon the nations will be summoned to you. So he's talking to the Muslims like one is invited to a feast. So people will come to Islam, is what he's saying. No, he said, no, the nations will be summoned to you to eat you. To devour you. Ah, uh, okay. Like a feast. Okay. It was said, will you, we be few in that day? In other words, will we be few in numbers? He said, no, you will be rather many in that day, but you will be like scum, like su such flowing down a torrent, the scum of water. Right. Like the dirt. Yeah. Particles that comes with water, the back end of water. Yeah. And after the fresh river has flowed and all the fresh waterfalls, you have only the dregs. Mm. He said, you'll be like that scum flowing down a torrent. Allah will remove your esteem from the hearts of your enemies and Allah will insert feebleness into your own hearts. It was said, O Messenger of Allah, what is this feebleness? The Prophet of Allah said, love for worldly life and hatred of death. And, and, that's, and now look, look what the Holy Quran says about the Jews. <laughs> and Exactly. So the Quran says that the reason the Jewish nation would commit these crimes is yeah. a love of the world. And the Prophet yeah. Muhammad saying that the Muslims would go exactly in the same direction. Yeah. Uh, and this is exactly what's happened. You know, the Muslims have become attached to worldly things they can't make worldly sacrifices for the sake of standing together against oppression against other Muslims. Mm. And so guess what? People take advantage of them. I mean, even at the end of last year, so to end of 2023, you know, the Muslim states or the Arab states, you know, the Muslim populated states couldn't even agree on an oil embargo yeah. uh, on, you know, towards Israel and towards the West. No. I mean, because obviously they were thinking, well, this is going to affect our bottom line. Yeah. So how many exactly tens right. of thousands of Palestinians are going to die and continue to die because of that? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, there may be other reasons as well, more geopolitical for that. But, um, but did you want to 
tell us a little bit about this. So this is a great example where the Quran then puts it. When we talk about the, the hypocrisy of some Jews, yeah. which led to their behavior in this particular way and which will invite the wrath of God. But, and we've said that the Muslims have gone down exactly the same path. And, and the Prophet Muhammad said that they would, they would mirror each other as, for instance, you know, the left foot or the, the left shoe mirrors the right shoe, that they yeah. will actually end up being exactly the same people and they'll be split into almost as many sects yeah. in, the, in, the, in the latter days. I think it's 71 and then Jesus. 72 and 73, yeah. So the Prophet Muhammad 14 centuries ago said that there would be 72 sects of Islam against one sect of Islam. Correct. And the 72 would be, in the uh, fire, would, be, he said. would be hellish and the 73rd would be a heavenly one. That's correct. And that's what happened in the 1974 judgment in Pakistan, which declared us as a parent apparently non-Muslims according to the constitution of yeah. Pakistan, which is obviously what God goes by is the constitution of Pakistan rather than, <laughs> rather than his divine eternal knowledge. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so let's go through that then. Let's go through that symmetry of the Muslims and the Jews and what the solution is that the Holy Quran gives. Why yeah. you tell us that? So this is a great chapter, chapter 25, verse 21. It, it talks about how the Muslims would turn their backs upon the Quran. Hmm. But the, the real solution was simply this, that a messenger was sent to the Jews, yeah. who was Jesus, to bring them away from from their worldliness yeah. and to instill in their hearts a spirit of sacrifice for their religion and sincerity in their faith again and to turn them back towards spirituality. Right. And he came 13, 1250 years after Moses mm. and similarly 1250 years after the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there was a messianic, uh, a messiah for the Muslims. His name was Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. He mm. was the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and he was the messiah of the Muslims. And, and what we're about to, I think, I think what we're about to show is, you know, incredible prophecy of how the Muslims would be acting in this kind of situation and in general. So why don't you, uh, well, I can start. Let's walk us through it. And we did not send any messengers before thee, but surely they ate food and walked in the street. So this is chapter 25. And we make some of you a trial for others to see whether you are steadfast. So the Holy Quran here is, is setting up this passage by saying that messengers are human beings. Yeah. They're not angels and they don't come down from heaven yeah. uh, in the physical sense. Which is right? what the beliefs of the Muslim is. So this is the main difference between us and other Muslims. Between it, Ahmadis and, Ahmadi and Muslim. Sunnis and Shias? Yeah, correct. So all other Muslims other than Ahmadi Muslims believe that uh, Jesus, who was from 2000 years ago, will descend upon the earth hmm. and he will... Uh, lead armies uh, against non-Muslims, kill large numbers of non-Muslims, force Islam upon them, completely mm. un-Islamic beliefs that we completely reject. Yeah. Whereas we believe that the coming of a Messiah amongst the Muslims, whose name would be Isa or Jesus, son of Mary, mm. means that he would perform the same function for the Muslims who mm. would become like the Jews before them yeah. as Jesus performed for the Jews of his time. Okay. And that just as Jesus eschewed, he, he did not obtain a political power, but his kingdom was a heavenly spiritual kingdom. The Muslim Messiah was to be a spiritual, heavenly sent reformer mm. whose kingdom would be spiritual in nature, not political and worldly. Yeah. So the main difference in us is that we believe in a Messiah who is born on this earth, lives on this earth, dies on this earth, like God always sends messengers. So that they can be a role model for so you, who also model. You know, live and die and... Yeah. Yeah. Exist on Whereas earth. they believe that Jesus will be like some kind of a uh, superhero from heaven. Yeah. will come with a sword in Silver one Surfer. hand. Silver Surfer. He's going to come and he's going to dominate the world. Mm. Uh, and he's basically going to be a mythical creature, effectively. Mm. Mm. You know, a 2,000 year old man who's going to get married, apparently, and have kids. The okay. Lord, Lord knows that's never been seen. Yeah. So, so I mean, that's what the Quran is, is speaking against here. And the Quran clearly here sets it up. It's saying, we've never sent any messengers before you. But they ate food and walked in the streets. They were people of the time. You know, and that's actually an incredible, uh, that's also a very good description of the of how Jesus is represented after the resurrection event in the Gospels, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, he's walking around after the resurrection. He yeah. says, can I have some food? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's more than that also because the Quran also says that um, both Jesus and his mother both, both used to eat food. La kulani ta'am. They both both ka'ana la kulani ta'am. They both used to. The perfect tense is used, mm. which you only use for people who no longer do something. Right. But they used to do something. Okay. Right. So it means they passed away. It means they passed away. So the Sunni belief can't be right. That's correct. So, you know, when, when Jesus comes and starts eating food, we'd be like, hold on a second. You used to eat food. You shouldn't be eating food anymore. Mm, mm. Right? Very good point. Very good point. Okay, let's go on. It says, And we make some of you a trial for others to see whether you are steadfast and thy Lord is all seeing. And those who do not expect a meeting with us say, why are not angels sent down to us? Or why do we not see our Lord? Surely they are too proud of themselves and have gone far in rebellion. What do you understand by that? 
Well, I mean, I think it's worth a discussion, but what's what's very interesting here is that it seems to be talking about an atheistic age. Those who do not expect a meeting with us means atheism. It means that this period in, in history that the Quran is talking about will be one where people don't believe in the unseen. They don't believe in the hereafter. They don't believe that they'll ever con- come into contact with God. And they say, why are not angels sent down to us? You yeah. know, Why can't I see these angels that you speak of, mm. right? Where are they? Why can't I see? And then literally, why do I? Why do we not see our Lord? Why do we not see God? That was, you know, Richard Dawkins' basic fundamental argument. Yeah. Which is, you know, why is God not empirically verifiable? Yeah. 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 And, and and also who created God. Who, but he even said that also, uh, he, he even said famously that, and I think we, we've done a video on it. Yeah. Many, like a year ago. Even if I could ago. see God, I'd think it was hallucination. Yeah. Well, he, no, he said, uh, even if I heard God's voice, you know, yeah. echoing across the heavens, I would think that I've gone mad. Richard, I am. Yeah. No, no. he wouldn't accept that. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't accept that. Um, surely, wait, go, go. surely they are too proud of themselves. Then this gives the diagnosis. Why is it that in this age, the, the, why have they got to this point? It's because they're pride. It's mm. because they are arrogant. They think that actually our two little eyes and our little brain yeah. is enough to process all of the, uh, all of existence, all of possible existence and to understand it and to penetrate into the depths of reality itself. Mm. No, they're too proud of themselves. Mm. Some things we can only understand through our spiritual eyes yeah. or some things we can only understand through faith, which means we believe it, that it's likely to exist, mm. but we cannot have perfect certainty. Mm. They're arrogant and they've gone far in rebellion. That refers to their moral conduct, yeah. which is plain to see. And then it goes on to say, on the day when they see the angels, there will be no good tidings on that day for the guilty, and they will cry. Would that there were a strong barrier, in other words, between us and the punishment. Well, well, that and also, you know, the Holy Quran here is saying is that if uh, faith is made so easy, mm. that it's literally a matter of witnessing. Then you'll then be no severely tri- punished for it. <laughs> well, well, that is, there, there's no trial in that. There's no element of trial. Yeah. Things are kept slightly hidden so that there's an element of trial. You have to have goodwill. This is what the founder of the Ahmadiyya community said, that you have to have goodwill will as your starting point in yeah. order to have belief in God for belief in God to mean anything. Yeah. Cause it has to be a moral test. So you have to say, okay, this man says these things. He seems like a good person. He's, you know, many people follow him. Let me try and take some of his spiritual practices and see if I too can have that spiritual. Is that withholding judgment? Mm. It's about recognizing one's own limitations. What's the line with Hamlet and the skull? You know, there are things greater in heaven and earth than the thought of in your philosophy, dear Horatio, right? Yeah, yeah. It's that. It's that feeling that yeah. I'm not that big. Yeah. You know, maybe there is something bigger than me. Maybe I should try it and see if it results in the results that they say it does, yeah. rather than writing it off offhand, first hand. Uh, and the Quran, the Quran is here telling us that the only day... Unless we have spiritual awakening in this life and we have revelation where God reveals himself to us, but that's a that's a process. A, that's a, process. That's a, a spiritual, goes long trial, spiritual yeah, process. And sacrifice that you go through. If you want complete manifestation of God, that's only going to happen in the next life. And if you have spent your whole present life denying that, then it's going to be a form of punishment. Yes, exactly. Um, and then it says, and we shall turn to the work they did and we shall scatter it into particles of dust. What do you take from that? You know, this is a clear reference to the last verses of Surah Al-Kahf. Right, know, right. Uh, the chapter of the Quran, the cave, where it says that, uh, shall we tell you of those who are the greatest losers in respect of their works, those whose life is all spent uh, seeking after the goods of this world, mm. or, so, so, those whose all, all effort is spent in seeking the goods of this world, uh, and yet they think that they are doing good works. Mm. Right? It's saying that your entire energy being spent upon worldliness mm. is the root cause and will be the root cause of all of your life's work being meaningless. And the reason is obvious. If all of your life's work is dedicated to worldliness, mm. then ultimately, when you die, that's it. Yeah. And as time marches onwards from your life, the influence and impact you had on the world reduces, reduces, reduces until there comes a point when in in the future, when it will not have mattered whether you had existed or not. Hmm. Even the greatest generals, the greatest kings, there will come a point for everybody in the history of the universe where it will not have mattered whether you existed or not. And if you did not dedicate yourself to spiritual matters because your soul will continue after death, then all of that effort will have gone to waste. Hmm. And, And so God isn't being vindictive here. He's actually warning you that the works you do will be scattered into particles of dust because you tied your works to vain and temporary matters mm. so that when the work when that stuff ends right mm. your efforts have ended that's it the strange thing is that atheists tend to cremate so they they accelerate this process <laughs> as well um 
Okay, let's continue. And then it says, the inmates of heaven on that day will be better off as regards their abode and better off in respect of their place of repose. Hmm. You know, their actions they lived in this life, which will become their heaven and the hereafter, hmm. will continue to exist hmm. because they worked for spiritual matters as well. And, and one can even apply that to meaning people in this life who live a heavenly life absolutely so on this day that they'll be in a better position and i think we so should what go, is this day we should we should we should i think we should go on a little bit because we want to get to the nub of it which yeah. is what you know what is this? this is talking about the atheistic society at the end of it. that's all we're trying to paint here uh, and it talks about on the day when heaven shall burst asunder with clouds and the angels shall be sent down in large numbers this refers to the, the verse of the quran which says that those who believe in the sonship of god um the christians that uh, the heaven might well nigh burst thereat and the earth cleave asunder because they ascribe a son to the ar-Rahman, to the gracious God. This is just in reference to the fact that on that day, the heaven shall burst asunder, which means that Christianity will be the ascendant religion. Hmm. And then it says the true kingdom on that day shall belong to the gracious and it shall be a hard day for the disbelievers. In other words, that's to be a time of great warfare, a great punishment, a great pain. Hmm. And it will say on that day, the wrongdoer will bite his hands and say, oh, would that I had taken away along with a messenger. You know, the wrongdoer will say, would that I had followed the messenger sent to me. So this is in reference, in actual fact, to the representative of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad alayhi salam. Hmm. Oh, woe is me that I would never take such a one for a friend. Hmm. This is talking about the Muslims having been misled yeah. by worldly friends. Because it doesn't talk about a disbeliever person. It doesn't talk yeah. about a disbeliever. It says the wrongdoer. Hmm. Yeah. Right? It's about the wrongdoer. When the Muslims have become wrongdoers hmm. and they would, they would take such as ones as friends who would lead them astray. To the Western world. Yeah. He led me astray from the reminder after it had come to me. Yeah. So the reminder has come to him, the Quran, he accepted it, but he was still misled. And Satan always deserts man in the hour of need. And then it says, and the messenger will say, oh, my Lord, my people indeed treated this Quran as a thing to be discarded. How do you understand that? Well, it's clear that this can only refer to a Muslim prophet to a muslim messenger because he says my people treated this quran this quran as a as a as a, as a discarded thing mm -hmm. so he's talking about this muslim messiah messenger muslim this messenger, messenger yeah. this muslim messenger is saying that the muslims have discarded the holy quran they've put it behind them yeah and that's how they became wrongdoers and they associated with those who are the friends of Satan and with Satan's people. Yeah. So, I mean, this- And who are Satan's people? We're not talking about any religious group here. We're talking about those who reject God's message uh, or those who ostensibly accept it, but do wrong and commit evils. Yeah. Well, it, it means that that many of the Muslims will unfortunately be counted among them. I mean, should we look at a clear example of how the Muslims have gone astray and yeah. uh, it's from recent news? So this is an example of the brazen hypocrisy of the Muslim nations. Let's set this up for a moment. No, let's let's go straight into it because okay. it's shocking and we can explain it afterwards. What is happening here? So this is another dreadful episode targeting Ahmadis in Sheikh Pura, Pakistan. A radical mob exhumed the dead body of an Ahmadi from his grave, flaunting their actions and mocking helpless Ahmadis there. State needs to act and rectify before reaching a point where rectification is impossible. I think we're already there, frankly. This is a very harrowing video. It's a, a mob of people mm. around a grave an Ahmadi Muslim grave, mm. and this follows That's on- the community to which we belong. Yeah, this is, follows on from a recent ish, incident before this of multiple graves being desecrated. Yeah. Uh, and this is something the Muslim community has been outraged by Isra Israeli government doing, yeah. and the Israeli IDF doing in Gaza, which is you know running tracks and bulldozers and, and tanks over uh, the graves of Palestinians, resulting in the demolition of headstones and the, mm. and the running over of them. But this has not been, this is a new, not a new thing with Ahmadis. This is something that's been happening decade in, decade out yeah. um, by, uh, in Pakistan in And particular. this is what people need to understand. This isn't just a, a bunch of random extremists as a one-off. This is state-sponsored persecution. These are state-sponsored actions because the state specifically demonizes our one community, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. In its constitution. Being, in its constitution and uh, supports all the mullahs against us. Yeah. Right? And the mullahs support the government. So it's a nice little system that they've got there. And, it, you know, it's, it's interesting to me because so many of these sort of Sunni influencers in the West will be so keen and and will make their whole career basically criticizing the West and Israel. Meanwhile, actually endorsing yeah. anti-Ahmadi anti -Ahmad, anti hatred yeah. and so many extremist beliefs. We've spoken, for instance, already on our channel about how Daniel Hakikudju and uh, 
another guy that he was with uh, on the PBD podcast and how they support apostasy laws. Yeah, Muslim, you know, Muslim, ske- Muslim, ske- no, um, Muslim metaphysician. Yeah, the Muslim, Muslim metaphysician. Jake, the Muslim metaphysician, yeah. right? Yeah. How these people who are basically Muslim influencers in the West who, you know, hate Israel and do all this anti-Israel content and are so much against, you know, religious persecution and stuff like that. But actually they'll support uh, many extremist beliefs yeah. which do lead to things like this. And they'll be what silent on this. They'll be completely you know, silent. They'll be, they'll be terribly angry about the silence of certain Jews on uh, Israel bulldozing Palestinian graves, which yeah. is absolutely horrific and shouldn't, uh, is absolutely awful. Mm. But they will themselves say nothing mm. about the active exhumation of dead bodies yeah. uh, of Ahmadis in Pakistan. And for instance, the Houthis. I mean, the Houthis are being, yeah. in some respects, fettered as you know these uh, great uh, rebels against defenders the, against pa- for Palestinian cause. Yeah, yeah, defenders of the Palestinian cause and, and rebels against the Western order, which one can argue that to some degree they are, but at the same time they have another faith. They've arrested several Ahmadi Muslims yeah. in their in Yemen and are persecuting them and and are and are, and are uh, detaining them without reason. Yeah. Right. And this is this is the the other side of the Muslim country. So all these many left liberals and many uh, Muslims in the West, they need to examine their own selves and yeah. you know try and order their own house before they just condemn the actions of others. Yeah, and that that and this hypocrisy, which is actually the most. It's hypocrisy that's the most ugly quality. Mm. You know, it's mm. interesting. The Quran opens Surah Al-Baqarah with the description of three types of people, believers, disbelievers, and, and hypocrites. Yeah. And with respect to hellfire, mm. the Quran says, it doesn't say the disbelievers will be in the, the lowest depths of hell. Mm. It doesn't say that. Mm. It says the hypocrites yeah. will be in the lowest depths of hell. Those who say one thing and do another. Yeah. Because if you disbelieve in something, you say, look, I don't like this. I don't mm. agree with it. At least you're honest. Yeah. At least you're honest to yourself. There's an honesty in that. Yeah. There's an honesty to that. And you know what? If you change your mind, you change your mind, you'll become a strong believer. Yeah. Right? That's happened with many people but, in, but, in, but, in but a history. Yeah. But a hypocrite, very difficult to reform a hypocrite mm. <laughs> because they're not honest to themselves. Mm. How are they going to hold fast to an honest position? Yeah. How are they going to make sacrifices for it? And this is the sad position of many, many Muslim nations and many, of the, much of the Muslim population, especially the ones who are so, who are more quote unquote religious. Yeah. I mean, another another example just came to mind, which we can't actually give details on, but um, a, a prominent academic, an academic in the Muslim world in a prominent Arab country who teaches Arabic to many of our team mm. has actually been detained yeah. and um, has been arrested for several months because he supported a particular political candidate. Yeah. So you know, in the run up to an Election. In the run-up to election. And, and it's actually, even after the, the election, is unfortunately still detained. Really? So, you know, we complain here in the West and left liberals and, you know, Muslim, many Muslims will complain quite rightly about the detention of Julian Assange or yeah. various other uh, various other censorship activities that go on. But actually, yeah. there's far more brazen versions of that in the Muslim, so-called Muslim world. And the Muslims blame blame the West for that as well. They say, oh, you're propping up these dictators, you yeah. depose them, etc. And that is has truth to it. But the reality is you get the leaders you deserve. Mm. Right. The Saudi, for example, and this is a great point that's been made about UNRWA. So we're going back to the UNRWA issue. Mm. So Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, he has actually um, covered this in his latest Friday sermon. Should we have a look yeah, at what yeah, he yeah. says? Yeah. He explains the situation with UNRWA. And again, you know, this is the, this is the value of the, the spiritual eye. Mm. He said something nobody else I've read say at all. And it's such a valid point and it's been completely been missed by the mainstream media. گذشتہ نام یہ خبر بھی تھی کہ یو این کی جو ایجنسی ہے مدد کرنے والی امریکہ اور یو کے وغیرہ نے انہیں مالی مدد دینے بند کر دی ہے انکار کر دیا کہ ان کے گیارہ یا بارہ لوگ حماس کے ساتھ ملے ہوئے تھے اس کی وجہ سے یہ ظلم کہ فلسطینیوں کو مدد نہ کرو یہ صرف یہ اس لیے ہے کہ ان کو مجبور کیا جائے اور کچھ بھی نہیں لیکن حیرت اس بات پہ ہے کہ اگر مغربی ملکوں نے مدد بند کی ہے تو یہ کوئی خبر نہیں آ رہی کہ کیوں نہیں تیل کی دولت رکھنے والے مسلمان ممالک نے یہ اعلان کیا کہ ہم یہ مدد کریں گے کیونکہ یو این ایجنسی نے اعلان کیا اگر پھر مدد نہ ملی تو فروری کے بعد ہم کوئی ایڈ نہیں پہنچا سکتے بہرحال اللہ تعالیٰ ان مسلمان ملکوں کو بھی اپنا کردار ادا کرنے کی توفیق اطاف فرمائے Okay, so what was your reaction to that when you first heard it? I thought it was just such a fantastic point. Um, mm. You know, the, the nations which have oil money 
uh, the Muslim nations he specifies. He says the nations have oil money, and then he specifies the Muslim nations. Um, why haven't they stepped up to the plate to fund UNRWA? Hmm. You know, these are not only nations that have a common religion to the majority of Palestinians. They also have a common broad ethnic grouping. And language. And language. These are more their people than they are the West's people. Yeah. Why aren't they concerned? Why don't they spend some of their money on UNRWA? I'm not saying at all that the United, the United States, the UK, the European behavior with defunding on, on allegations which are completely unproven yet mm. is valid. Or even if, they are, to be fair, they're highly, highly credible. <laughs> but not investigated. <laughs> You're right. But even if they were valid, that's still 0.04% of the, mm. of the work, of the work, of the, you know, um, employment of UNRWA in, in Gaza. And it's completely unreasonable on that basis to cut off aid to 2 million people. Yeah. But nevertheless, there's also the other question that it's a matter of, you know, it's a matter of wonderment or, you know, shock and surprise that if they're not funding it, why don't at least the nations which are of the same ethnic group, of the same religion, of the same language, why don't they step up to the plate when they've got bags full of money? Hmm. This is, I don't get it. I, I mean, it exposes the truth of the Quranic statement when messengers come, specifically the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his reflection, the Prophet Messiah, the, the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, that corruption has spread over land and sea. Yeah. That actually moral death has spread everywhere. Yeah. And you can't look anywhere without seeing it. You yeah. can't extend your hand into any land that has moral splendor and truth. Mm. Instead, what we have is this uh, position at the, at the moment, where is that values, you know, it goes back to what we said at the beginning. Values are not principles if they're not applied universally. Yeah. Okay. It exposes values as merely being tools yeah. to serve your self-interest. And subject others. If, you, if you're saying that actually people should be free and they should be free to pray as they want and the Palestinians should be free to live their own lives, but you're also arresting Ahmadis in your own country, then actually you don't hold that value. Yeah. You're using that value against your enemy as a tactic. Yeah. If you're saying that, you know, Palestinians should be supported and they should be protected while persecuting a minority within your own country, like since Pakistan does, since through your constitution yeah. for 50 years, yeah. then you don't hold that value. Yeah, exactly. You have a principle which is a fake principle and it's actually a tactic for your own geopolitical gain. It's almost like Ahmadis are like the... Uh, the canary in the coal mine. They're the canary in the coal mine. That's the perfect way of putting it. They're the, they're the ones who prove the, the, the truth of the falsity of, of different people espousing different values. That's absolutely right. A I and to the credit of what would you say about the Western nations then? Well, the Western nations, uh, you know, they have established themselves upon the principle of freedom of religion. Mm. Uh, whether that continues in the future, we will see. Mm. The reality is, is I think a lot of the uh, established morals of the West mm. have gradually eroded with the loss of their religious belief entirely. Yeah. Um, and so even those morals that they held to flimsily yeah. are now being eroded completely. Um, and you can see this with press freedoms. You can see this with uh, honesty. You know, with the key, probably the key... Uh, British value, you could say, was freedom of religion. Mm. But the the support that it's lent to Israel during this entire period um, of uh, against the freedom of the Palestinians uh, in the West Bank, in, in Gaza, it, it does smack of um, uh, a serious loss of this kind of concept of freedom of uh, of individual rights. Yeah, you know. So we'll have to see what happens. I think once the Muslims spread in the UK and the US. We don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows the future. Nobody who should be predicting the future, I think. Mm. But I suspect there will be a backlash. if you had to. If I had to, I, I suspect there would be a severe backlash mm. against Muslims and against groups spreading Islam um, successfully in the West. You see, we're, we're a kind of, we're like, we're, we're utilized, I think, to some extent as a pet. Yeah. Um, that's useful because we can be used as a tool to show Muslim nations, oh, look how well we treat your, my, our minority Muslim communities. Mm. But, you know, if we were to become 25% of the population, do you think that we'd be better treated in, in such a civilized fashion? Well, we, I'm not entirely sure whether that would be the case. We can only hope and pray so. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, God and God's people will be the victors. Absolutely. I mean, you can, you know, you, you can't keep a good man down. And there's, there's, <laughs> there's, 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 nothing, there's nothing greater than Islam Ahmadiyya in the world. And, and I think actually the, the, the thing is people see Islam as a threat. It's not a threat, it's a liberation. It's a liberation from slavery to the world. That's right. And this is what many Western people come into Islam realize. Yeah. You know, there's this ridiculous idea that we can, that the West actually preaches freedom. The West preaches freedom from religious law. 
but it preaches in on the other side of that coin is slavery to your natural desires. What we mean by, by religious law is not you know legal Sharia. Mm. What we mean is moral guidance, moral, moral uh, taking upon yourself certain stipulated moral conditions and moral behaviors. Well, like the Ten, given, like, like, like the ten Commandments. Yeah, like the Ten That's Commandments. That's a religious law. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So when they say that you actually, you know, we have so much freedom in the West, actually individuals find, find themselves enslaved to all kinds of things. You always have a God to your economic system, which is oppressive, to your base desires, and people get into these horrible habits and tendencies which they yeah. can't break out of. Yeah. Whereas actually if you... And also to their work. You yeah. know, to, to thinking that their work is the be and end all of life. Or to the gaze of others. I mean, how many how many girls on Instagram have just wasted their lives through yeah. basically vanity? How yeah. many boys on Instagram have done the same, <laughs> you know, taking trend and testosterone and all these things really? to try and build themselves I don't up? Have, I don't have Instagram. So. Oh, you're, you're a, that's why, that's hence your enlightenment. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, these, you know, you're always enslaved to something. Well, to I'm not vanity. on it. I think I have a profile, but I can't. You do have a profile. It. I'd like one photo, <laughs> I think. Um, so people are always enslaved to something, but what Islam represents is not a threat. It's actually a balancing of things. It's a balancing of your different natural desires. And it's saying that actually you become a servant of God yeah. and you will actually have true enlightenment and liberation. Yeah. So that's the real threat. The real threat to the Western order is God. Is, is God. <laughs> it's right, God. Because God is the real sovereign. Yeah. And the fact that actually you can have an Islam, which is actually peaceful and moderate, yeah. but still means that you are away from the Western cultural system. Yeah. If you want to call it that, yeah. that's the real threat. So we'll see how, how things play out in the West. Yeah. Thanks very much for watching. We are on uh, YouTube. We are on social media, all kinds of channels. We're also behind you. Look. Yeah. <laughs> uh, please do comment, like, and subscribe. Peace be upon you. Peace be on you.